Brother Ricky is going to be ministering on the showbread this afternoon. And he has two texts that he's going to be uh, gleaning from. The first one's going to be found in Exodus 25, 23 through 30. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a handbreadth round about. And thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners, there on the there that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for place of the staves to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, that the table may be borne with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and the spoons thereof, and covers thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover with all of pure gold shalt thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. And again in Leviticus 24, verses 5 through 6. And thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six, two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. Again, we see the very, the very nature of God in this and being specific and what he is desiring and require, requires of his people to do. There were 12 loaves. And when you think of 12 loaves, you automatically, your mind goes to the 12 tribes. These are God's people. These are whom he called. They, he put his name on them, and they are his people. And so you, so you reason that God always has his people in sight. They are always in his view. He is always beholding his people. And we see this written throughout scriptures, both in the Old Covenant and in the New but in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says this, For the eyes of the Lord run, run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein, well, it, it goes on, he's talking about something else. But the point is, his eyes are running to and fro. He's looking. He's looking at his people, those, those people who have their hearts toward him. Amen. Again, in Proverbs 15.3, we're told that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, and he's beholding both good and evil. So he sees what is good, and he sees what's not good. He is aware of what's happening. God has not removed himself from the salvation that he was showing in the tabernacle, and he's not removed himself from the salvation that we are now partaking of in Christ. In Psalm 33:18, David, David wrote this, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. We've talked about that. Brother Bob just spoke on coming in to the, to the tabernacle and to the place where God is with fear. So the, eyes, the, eyes of, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. So the Lord is looking He's looking at his people. He's beholding what they are doing. We're told in the last book of the Old Covenant that a book of remembrance had, has been written. Why? Because the Lord saw that his people met often one with another. He was aware of what they were doing. He was beholding them. We're told that we're going to have to give an account for every deed done in our body while we're in the earth. Is it going to be a surprise to the Lord of glory when we tell him what we confess to him? No, he's seeing it. He's seeing what we're doing now. He's beholding us now. We're going to have to give an account. We're going to have to confess to him what is going on now. We talk often about when we do something, we do it heartily is unto the Lord. Why? Because he's 
watching. He's seeing us. He's seeing us do these things. This bread that, that had to be prepared, um, you, if you'll note in Leviticus, it had to be a certain kind of bread. It had to be made from fine grain, fine grain. It couldn't just be some haphazard leftover coarse grain. It had to be ground. There was labor that, invo that was involved in preparing this bread. And there's been a lot of talk about that this weekend. There was labor that went in to every aspect of the tabernacle. Uh -huh. And the bread was not excluded from this labor. And it dawned on me last night that these brethren were in the wilderness. The Israelites were in the wilderness. <laughs> not only could they not go down to their local grocery store and buy this grain, but not anything good grows in the wilderness. So the Lord had to provide this fine flour. He had to provide the oil that went into making this bread. He had to provide these things. It had to be precise and it had to be perfect, just like we do, brethren. The Lord is perfecting us, just like he did in this bread. He is making us perfect so he is able to behold us, so he can look upon us. Another aspect of this bread is that it was for the high priest and the priest that, that labored and that ministered in the tabernacle. The bread had to be fresh. It was replaced every Sabbath day, and it all had to be consumed. It could not be left over. They couldn't share it with those that were outside the camp, if you will. It had to be consumed. It was for their nourishment. Another thing to be seen here is it had to be consumed in the holy place. They couldn't wrap it up and take it home for leftovers. They had to eat it all in the holy place. Why is this? God was there. He was communing with his people. He was showing what kind of communion there would be for all of his people when Christ offered up himself as a sacrifice. This communion is very precious for the Lord. And it, that's why it had to take place every single week. It could not, they could not miss a week. This communion was special to the Lord. The priests were able to receive strength for their labors. Now we talked about today how many, how much blood was shed in every sacrifice throughout the history of the tabernacle. So imagine how much work was involved in preparing the sacrifice, in cleaning up after the sacrifice and cleaning the materials that were used in the sacrifice and offerings. So these priests, they needed strength, they needed nourishment. And this was a provision of God. So what, what is the type and the shadow here that we're gonna look at in the bread? Well, we're told in Revelation um, 1, five through six, that we have been made kings and priests because of the offering that Christ made. So if we've been made kings and priests, then we've also been supplied with a bread, if you will. Yeah. In John 6, Jesus, I know that you all are familiar with this text, this passage in John 6, actually the whole chapter, really. Jesus has been talking to the multitude for three days. He looks upon them and he sees that they're hungry and he was moved with compassion. And so he decided that he needed to feed these people. Now, it wasn't a group like us, maybe close to 50, 75. It was 5,000 men and more, children and women. And so his, it was a time of insight for his apostles as well. But the point Jesus was making here wasn't that he was able to physically nourish the flesh. He wasn't physically just, he did that. It was a miracle. He divided the loaves and the fish. But his point was later on, he shares with us in John 30, or 6, 35. He says, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus is this bread. God was showing forth in his tabernacle that the bread that the priests were able to partake of, that he was pointing to Christ. Christ is the one that was going to nourish his people. Again, in verse 51, he said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. 
and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now you know that pretty soon, later on this chapter, there are going to be many of his disciples that leave him because they were offended at this word. They were offended that he told them that they were going to have to partake of his flesh and his blood. I pray that there are none here that find offense in these words because if you receive these words as Peter did, remember Peter's response was, to whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of life. So if we are able to partake of this bread, then we shall live. There's a saying that's used often, and I don't, I don't generally like to bring in different phrases like this, but I think it's pertinent to what we're talking about. We're talking about all or nothing here. Yes. You either partake all of Christ or you get none of him. Yes, Just like the priest had to partake of all of the bread, yes. we must partake of all of Christ or we get none of the blessings none of the promises, and we will not inherit eternal life. So, brethren, today, uh, Brother Ricky is going to do an excellent, um, excellent thing of opening this truth up, but I want to exhort all of us to be willing at whatever cost to be able to partake of all of Christ so that we might live with him. Amen.